Hey folks, this is Alexander Wynn. And Lacey Hannon. And we are here with the latest episode of The Synthesis, a show where we check out scientific and historical accuracy in film and television. We are excited to get through more of The Martian. Yes. Though I think this time we won't promise to get to the end. We won't, because so we thought we were going to do the whole movie in one episode, <laughs> and we did a third of it. Yes. So we're here to do probably the next third, but who knows? We can aim for the finish line and yeah. then maybe just walk it in. Yeah, like, you know, we'll, like we'll, those... we'll retroactively be like, see, we knew it would take that long. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Yeah. It's kind of going to be like me in high school when I decided to take up track again, but in my senior year, and I was barely making it to the finish line. Yeah. It's going to be nice. It'll be, be nice. It'll, I will have, there will be a nostalgia factor for me. Yes. Um, so. I don't remember where we were, though. Where yeah, were so we? we were picking up with hexadecimals. They've gotten right. the they've gotten the Pathfinder working that beautiful Pathfinder moment, oh, and I loved it. he gets it back to the Hab, and they're able to connect. And yes, are you reading me? Yes, no. They point the camera at yes. He freaks out, and now, as Tim very pointedly says, they're not really going to be able to have a conversation. And so Mark starts wondering, okay, how can we actually do this? He realizes that twenty six letters plus a question card around a circle is he's not going to be able to tell what the camera is aimed at so he comes up with hexadecimals right. and this is this is one of those things that is interesting because i feel like either the making water sequence or the hexadecimal sequence in the martian is probably the most famous thing from the martian uh but there's an interesting little thing about this scene in the movie which is that this is really the only time that we see mark figuring something out. This is one of the big differences between the book and the movie, is in the book, it's all about sort of doing the math and figuring it out and approaching the solution and kind of talking your way, or approaching the problem and sort of talking your way toward a solution. And that's not something that really makes it into the movie. You know, in the movie, he mostly has a solution. And then he sits down in front of the GoPro and says, this is what I'm going to do. Or sometimes even just, this is what I've already done. And this is the one scene where we actually see him chewing on a potato going, what am I going to do? And then he goes, hexadecimals. And you see the moment of realization. And then we get to see him going through Johansson's stuff yep. as he's looking for, because she's a big old nerd yep. in his opinion. Big, big nerd. And of course she'll have a hexadecimal table or whatever. Yeah. So I like, I don't know. Is that a thing that people have? Like I, I'm a, I'm a computer developer, but I don't have a hexadecimal table and a printed out book. That seems, I don't know, maybe. I mean, I guess it makes sense that if you, if you do like deep code kind of operating system level stuff, then maybe you would need it on a physical book because by definition your computer isn't working. But yeah. Yeah. I've, I, so my uncle is a rocket scientist and he does project management for various experiments. Um, and he goes to these like science conferences and my mom went to one or something with him once and she brought back this weird little booklet of just like deep deep equations for <laughs> random stuff and she's like alex needs this and it was like <laughs> I, I'm telling you guys, it was some of the weirdest stuff I've ever seen about like lasers and it was just like all over the place. But apparently some people need this. Yep. And according to my mother, Alex did. I'm not entirely sure why. So I suppose. Who doesn't need a big book of equations? I mean, come on. You have never opened it once and I have opened it multiple times. Then I guess you need a big book of equations. <laughs> um. Anyway, what I'm saying is <laughs> I suppose that there are some people out there that would do this. Yeah, that's fair. Um, okay, anyway, I did enjoy the um, hexadecimal yeah. portion. And I like the sped up t like slash time lapse. Yeah. Whatever it was that they were doing with yeah. that. Yeah, watching them sort of build the setup necessary. Because that's actually something that they don't really talk about in the book is, you know, Mark has his pathfinder with a bunch of signs around the around the circumference but they build one on earth too because they need to be able to like practice like they need to make the message and figure out what sequence they're going to send to him to make it to make it work so it was fun watching them sort of build the dummy version and then he's building the real version uh -huh. and, yeah 
Um, and then he, they, they pretty quickly go to hacking the rover, which is smart because watching him watch the thing go round and round is pretty tedious. And so pretty quickly we get to, hey, now I can hack the rover's operating system and connect it to Pathfinder. And now I can just type like a text message. And uh, I have to say, Mark's reaction to getting Vincent's first message is pretty sweet. He, he has a whole sort of, he starts to cry and all this, and it's just, you know, hey, are you reading me or something? And it's, it's pretty poignant. And then we also have the, he asks about how is the crew doing? Like, yeah. having left me behind, and Vincent has to figure out mm -hmm. what to say. Yeah. And then... I love that his what the fuck reaction is silenced by the camera because he because <laughs> he's in the rover yeah. and the camera is outside of it. So the camera is in vacuum, yeah. essentially, or near. And so it's completely silenced and you just see him <laughs> and his reaction just like swearing up a storm. <laughs> just like, yeah. And I love that like well, then we come back to Earth and we have Mitch who's laughing at Mark's anger because he's angry too. Yeah. Like this is vindication for yeah, Mitch. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so that was a nice moment of, yeah. because it's always Venkat and uh, Mark talking. It's not really Mitch and Mark, which actually I had never considered this in the book, but that's actually surprising, seeing as Mitch is the the commander of this mission, right? Yeah. Well, I forget what yeah. his specific title is, but, but he's, he's he's in charge he's, of this. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Lewis is in charge on the ship, but right. as far as I'm aware, Mitch yeah. is in charge, He's in charge of the of entire Ares three. Yeah. yeah, so it's it's a little bit odd, and yeah. I am surprised now that I think about it. Not that I not that I mind too much, but right. maybe maybe Mitch has other things he has to continue doing. I don't yeah. know. <laughs> um, but one of the things that I love about Sean Bean being Mitch is he's really good at being emotional and subtle. Yes, you know. Uh, Nothing he does is ever too big, yeah. and which is funny because he plays a lot of larger than life characters. It's not really something I, I feel like. If you said to the average person, Sean Bean is a re is a very subtle actor, I feel like you'd have to kind of sell them on that idea. Yeah, because <laughs> he plays a lot of sort of characters like Boromir in Lord of the Rings, and right, right, right. and yet even Boromir, there's a lot of subtlety there. You know, like uh -huh. that that character is very nuanced for for being essentially sort of a meathead. He's, yeah. he's got a lot going on. As, I mean, I think that you could say between this and Game of Thrones, he's got, yeah. the, the subtlety is on his, on his, for sure. his side. Yeah. But uh, yeah, so I, I thoroughly enjoy Sean Bean in this moment. Mm -hmm. I think there are some other places where you and I have kind of disagreed yeah. on the Mitch stuff in this movie, but here I'm all about it. Mm -hmm. um, a change that we get from the book are I think mm -hmm. are the data dumps. Um, so, you know, they when the whole crew was together, mm -hmm. they'd get emails and you know those sorts of data dumps from their families or whoever. Mm -hmm. And we don't see that happen in the book um, when he gets in communication with Earth again. But we know that it happens here because a he says it, and then he gives us an example because the University of Chicago says he has colonized Mars. He's yeah. not the one to have thought of it. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think in the book he mentions once he's in contact that like he got a letter from the president and that sort of thing, um, but they don't make as big a deal of it. Um, well, and, and I guess to me the reason why it's significant is because of course you get a letter from the president. Yeah. You are stuck on Mars. They are going to make that happen. Yeah. The president requests being able to write to Mark Watney on Mars. He just can't. He just can't. Just and also one like, of the perks of being president. Yeah. <laughs> and also like let's be honest, he's gonna he of course wants to be one of the first people to write a letter to Mars. Like, come on. Yeah. But um this is different because it kind of changes some things. You would have, you know, if you have like the University of Chicago being able to reach him and if you mm -hmm. have various groups being able to reach him and his parents and all of this I think that really changes the mentality of the character who's there. Yeah. And it is also going to change what's happening back on Earth because they're going to have, there's going to be more conversation. What did they call it? They they had the, 
Mark Watney. The Watney report. The Watney report. Yeah. And on that, they're going to say, oh, you know, we found out that so-and-so sent him Mm -hmm. an email about this or whatever. Yeah. And I I think it's really important that this this is a really important change because it would change his... um, experience it's his, his yeah. experience there yeah and we don't see a change in his experience between the book and the movie so i feel like the, the psychology is off yeah and i'm surprised by that interesting yeah um, that's an interesting deduction so um here to help guys so next up we cut back to the hermes uh which unless you have something else that you want to um n- n- no no. I have. No, you're good. You say no, that in I a don't. very I, suspicious way. No, we're, you're fine. Right. You're fine. All right. Um, so we cut back to the Hermes, and you guys, the Hermes is such an incredible ship. Like that, the design of the Hermes in the movie, I could just go, on, like, I could spend all day, this whole episode, just talking about the Hermes and all the little nuances of how it was designed. There's. It, it is, by the way, very different from Andy Weir's concept of the Hermes. Really? Uh, yeah. Andy Weir's concept of the Hermes is a lot simpler, and I get the sense a lot smaller. Um, his Hermes is sort of teardrop-shaped. It's sort of, if you, if you picture sort of the stereotypical space capsule from, from, you know, the 60s and 70s, sort of looks like a cone with a rounded bottom, uh, my understanding is that Andy Weir's vision of the Hermes looked like a really big version of that. And so it would spin. And so if you go to the wider end, the spin is creating gravity. But if you go to the narrower end, it's not. And uh, that's why they talk about the Hermes keeping its aero braking shape because mm. it uses its body to break against the atmosphere to slow down which if you used the Hermes from the movie, that would just start ripping pieces off. <laughs> like that, that would look like the last scene of gravity when the, when the space station is coming into the atmosphere and it's just ripping apart because that's not an arrow breaking shape. That being said, it's so cool. It's like the ultimate manifestation of the International Space Station sort of school of design. And uh, there are a few instances of ships like this. There's the Hermes from the Martian. Uh, there's the Antares from... Uh, Defying Gravity, there are a few instances of sci-fi spaceships built in that kind of International Space Station school of design, and I just love them always. Okay, so my question is, and this goes for everybody out there, I want to know your favorite sci-fi ship. Mm, That that is a, a path that leads to madness. No. Well, okay, here, I'll give you a couple of things yeah. to help you with this. Remove the crew from it. So like Okay. So it's if, not that you love the people from Firefly, yes. it's that you love the Serenity itself. Yes. Like, and that's that's exactly yeah. what I was gonna use. Is okay. The Serenity <laughs> is not the most beautiful ship. You yeah. love the crew. Come on. Yeah. And they love Serenity, so we love Serenity. You know, it doesn't yeah. like but it, it could still be the Serenity. I don't c I don't care what you pick. I'm just yeah. curious what it is. Honestly. Is it the Enterprise? Is it I mean it's sort of it, it's hard to compare ships of different levels of capability you know like you know using using serenity for example it's hard to compare serenity to the uss enterprise because the uss enterprise can do so much more that's not true i I tell you it's not true because people can pick their favorite cars and their car their favorite cars could be you know something that's like a muscle car versus a a military car or something that's like a little Mazda Miata, you know? That's kind of what I mean. It's like all cars fundamentally do the same thing. This is more like saying, what's your favorite vehicle? And having to compare a Corvette to an I'm still asking the question. I'm not, (laughs) I I don't have a problem. If you'd let me finish, I will answer it. Okay, okay, Um, okay. But it's, it's a little bit hard to compare because there are such big differences in capability but honestly if we're just going off of sort of the design of the ship itself just the the aesthetics Mm -hmm. i think it might be the hermes for me i think is literally my favorite spaceship in terms of just to look at interesting yeah okay Mm -hmm. i i actually have to think on it yeah because i'm not sure yeah i mean there are so you know like i love the normandy from mass effect I love the Enterprise, like, you know, the Enterprise, I mean, so many Enterprises, but the Enterprise D and E especially. Oh, my God. Deep nerd over here. Yeah, it's not even deep nerd. It's just, did did you like the the 
Kirk Enterprise or the Picard Enterprise or whatever. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I yeah, it might be the Hermes. I just I I love that. I love that realism. I love that scientific, like, this looks like a thing that could actually exist. This looks like real scientists put work I into of, it. I'm a little surprised that you didn't say something from um, The Expanse. You know, that's the thing about The Expanse is, to me, almost all the ships from The Expanse fall into that category of what you were talking about with Serenity, where it's like, they're not cool to look at that's kind of the point is that they're not cool to look at they're no. purely functional no i mean i would still say what's the the medina you can still medina count station that yeah because that was meant yeah. to be a, a generational ship right yeah. so that counts and then you get mao's ship at one yeah. point and mao's ship was pretty awesome talking about the razorback the no, no no not not the razorback the like his Oh, his personal like his, yacht. <laughs> yeah. yeah, the one that we yeah, see that him cool. and uh, or Bobby and um, Avasarala fighting, on. fighting yeah. on. So, yeah. um, um, Iman Economist has weighed in and said maybe the Orville. That's a oh, good one. Yeah. the Orville is a really good design. Yeah, um, I don't remember it as well as I feel like I should. Yeah, it's sort of like you took the saucer section of the USS Voyager and then strapped a couple of sort of rings to the back. It's yeah. a, it's an interesting, yeah. That is a good one. Yeah. I feel like I should know that one just because I've auditioned for that show a handful yeah. of times. Like it. Yeah. But no, no. I don't remember it. Sorry. Um, if you are watching live on YouTube Live, weigh in in the comments and let us know what your favorite spaceship is. If you are listening after the fact, then uh, I feel guess free. leave us a comment. Yeah. yeah, feel free to leave us a comment elsewhere. Yeah, exactly. Um, okay. So we can we can move yeah, on. Yeah, we can. I move just on. I just needed I just needed to know. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so, yeah, I I love really. So I, I wrote this down as the Earth Gang in my notes, and I legitimately can't remember if that's the <laughs> gang that is currently on Earth, like uh, Annie and Mitch and all them, <coughs> or if this is the Aries Three crew. Sorry, I swallowed down the wrong side. <laughs> Lacey, Lacey forgot how to breathe. Um, <laughs> I'm so sorry, guys. You're all good. Uh, but really both the the NASA crew and also the Ares 3 crew I just I love their camaraderie they do, the actors and the writers do a really good job of seeming like people who have worked together for years you know like yes. the the line is from the book when Annie asks them to get a photo of Mark with it without his helmet and Venkat says well if he takes off his helmet he'll die yeah. that's a good line <laughs> from the book, in the book but in the movie the way that Kristen Wiig and Chuotel Ejufor deliver those lines. It's not just a funny line. It's giving your coworker a hard time who you've known for a long time. Like, I, I don't know what it is. There's something in the way he delivers it that he's, well, I could ask him to take his head off, helmet off, but then he'd, you know, die. And then a couple of people laugh in the background. And it just, you can, you get the sense that they give each other hell. This See, is what these two do. It, it, one of the nice things about seeing something on screen versus reading the book is that all of these actors are going to bring that to their performance. Uh, yeah. The history, good actors anyway, yeah. bring history to their characters, right? And we kind of forget about that in our imagination. We, we, we recognize that people have known each other for a really long time, but oftentimes when you're writing a work scene, mm -hmm. it, doesn't, it doesn't come across as much as maybe you want it to. Yeah. Because you'd have to write every single detail yeah. to get all of that. And an actor is just going to bring that. And otherwise, it's between you and the author to try and do that. So it is. they did a really, really nice job with yeah. it. Yeah. And unrelated details, especially. Like, you know, when you're reading a book, you, you visualize plenty of details, but it's always sort of relevant to what's happening. Uh -huh. Whereas one of the nice things about actors is that they can put some thought into, like, did this character get enough sleep last night? Or, you know, these sort of random things that happen in real life that add nuance that aren't relevant to the story but they just make it a little you know more interesting and that's mm -hmm. everybody in this movie is just so good so i think this is the same part where we see teddy stressing about the margin of getting there on soul 868 and the potatoes only last to um soul 912 and he doesn't like that margin mm -hmm. and then we immediately jump back to yeah. mars <laughs> and in, like first thing 
the hat blows up and the crops are dead. Yeah. So. <laughs> Which is like, this is one of those things. You know, I I love the Martian in the book, but there are some things that movies just do better than books, and one of them is the explosion. <laughs> Because, whoa, I don't, if I remember correctly in the book, we don't even witness it. We just pick up with, hey, this just happened, and he's just telling us about it. But man, watching him walk into the airlock, and everything's just fine, and then he presses a button, and all of a sudden, a warning klaxon starts going off, and the canvas rips, and then the whole thing just gets launched through the air, and you're watching him bounce around on the inside. We get, we get it. And yeah. Be, because he's, he's. Oh, is that one of the exposition moments where it's? I believe so, It's from yeah. Mars's perspective. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but but I, oh. we get, we get a complete change on how this gets handled. Yeah. Because he doesn't do the smoke thing yeah. to find the, the rip in or the the tear in the airlock. Mm -hmm. We. Um, because there isn't one. There he's isn't just, one. He just fixes his suit yeah. and he's good to go. His his suit is the only thing that's losing air. Yeah. And we don't see him trying to figure out, okay, how am I going to get back to the hab mm -hmm. and doing the whole, like, throwing yeah. himself against the airlock because he knows he only has so much time because yeah. of oxygen, right? Yeah. And so we, we miss a lot of that, and I totally get not doing the smoke thing. Yeah. That takes a lot of time. But the... The duct tape, I felt like, didn't have quite... They they did manage to have the tension pretty mm -hmm. high because you have the alarms and all of that going yeah. off. But again, we miss seeing him figure out a solution. Yeah. And that's, again, it's just a little bit frustrating, mm -hmm. um, especially because it affects his physical capabilities for a little while. Yeah. You know, he has to... He, he hurts himself and... And he wasn't super hurt in the explosion itself. Right. And it's really getting the airlock back to the hab. Um, because if you remember in the book, he throws himself against the airlock and essentially rolls it yeah. back to the hab, which is a big deal. Um, anyway, so uh, that was, it was different. It wasn't yeah. terrible. It just wasn't as interesting to yeah. me. It's understandable, but yeah. a little less cool. Yeah. I will say, though, that seeing the dead potato plants oh. is it's it's post-apocalyptic yeah. like the way that scene is filmed it really looks like the end of the world and i love that because it is like this is everything he's been working toward and, and we get to see the ugh. the frost slash snow yeah and it's kind of hard to imagine it there mm -hmm. especially inside and the way that they showed that it was such a, it was a beautiful heartbreaking image i yeah. i teared up for yeah. sure i go figure but yeah <laughs> um uh he does get into the rover and this was the moment where i realized a very important design change which uh doesn't end up having a huge uh impact on the rest of the movie because they cut out certain scenes from the book but the rover has no airlock he would not have been able to do the things that he did in the book because in the book, the rover has an airlock so he can, you know, be in the rover fully pressurized and then like, you know, sort of keep the rover pressurized when he steps out. In the movie, there's just a door. So if you step out, you have to depressurize the interior of the rover. Yeah. So that is one of those things that is sort of small but important. We also get that he... Um I think it's about this time in the book that he loses contact with Mars, like he, his yeah. communication. And we that never happens. No. Um, which, again, to me, they've lowered the stakes of the movie. They've found other ways to keep the stakes high, but to me, they're, s they're not as high as the book mm -hmm. because we're not having to see him panic ever. Because if you remember, him trying to figure out how to get from the airlock to the hab includes like, okay... I have to get under this canvas and mm -hmm. I'm only doing things with one hand because I've messed with the arm of this suit, if I remember yeah. correctly. And he only had one arm because yeah. he had to, he had to um, adhese it closed. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And so like there are all of these little things that because you're not seeing him come up with solutions or, you know, in a state of like high, high stress. Mm -hmm. It changes the emotional state of the movie. Yeah. 
and I found that disappointing. Uh, they still did a good job in a lot of ways um, getting around some of this, because otherwise it would be a four and a half hour movie. Yeah, at least. Uh, yeah, at least. But um, one of those is that he can always talk yeah. to Earth. Yeah, he never loses. And this is actually, you know, we talked last week, we talked about how they kept the moment where he blew himself up, even though they removed the reason why he blew himself up. And there's actually another one of those moments coming up where uh, he he says a line that doesn't make sense because he's still in contact with Earth. Like, the only reason that that made sense is because he wasn't in contact with Earth anymore. Do so you remember we'll, what it was? Yeah, it's about the pirate. It's about the space pirate. Oh, right, so right, we'll, right. We'll get okay. to it in a bit. Um, yeah, really, I hadn't thought about it in these terms, but but based on what you were just saying, I think a, a decent way to describe the movie of The Martian is it's the exact same story as the book if things had been a little easier. You yes. know, if, if, if it had just not been quite so hard, if, there, if, if, if a few more things had just gone well instead of accidents happening and, you know, that sort of stuff, then it would be the movie. Yeah. It's just... I, yeah. We get to see Martinez and Watt. Watney talk. Yeah. And Although, just before before we move oh. on to that, uh, I did love the fact that we got Mark breaking. When the crops yes. are dead, he goes into the rover, and he starts to write a message, and Matt Damon's performance is so great because you can tell that he's trying not to lose control, and that is something that a lot of actors sort of can't do or maybe don't think to do is the I'm feeling one thing, but I'm fighting it. Yeah. I'm, I'm trying masking. not to. And especially when they're alone, you know, it's one thing to sort of be keeping a secret from a person you're talking to, but when you're alone in a room and he's trying to keep it together and he, he, he like reaches for the keyboard and then stops himself and kind of thinks for a minute and composes himself. And then he reaches for the keyboard again and he just breaks. And all of a sudden he's like slamming his hand against the ceiling of the Rover and screaming and crying. And it's just, because you're trying yeah. to trick yourself into believing that you can manage without yeah. the emotional break. Yeah. But oftentimes, the only way that you can manage to is out. to have the emotional break. Yeah. And that is one of the changes that we see between the characters of the book and the movie, mm -hmm. which is that Mark Watney in the book cries. And he yeah. is, he did, we, we talked about the lack of toxic masculinity yeah. that he has. And I'm not saying that trying not to cry is toxic masculinity. I'm just saying that there's a difference in his emotional, his his willingness to have a larger emotional capacity. Well, and and again, his his reasons too, because as we've established, the movie is sort of playing on easy mode, and so a lot of the things that would cause him to break, he just doesn't. You know, like you were saying, he doesn't hurt his back, and so we don't see him sort of nursing an injury and taking yeah. care of himself because he doesn't have to. We don't see him getting excited about a bath. I know, right? I, I imagine there are a lot of women in the audience who would have loved to see Matt Damon get really excited I mean, about having a bath. It depends on how skinny he is. Yeah, earlier in the movie is better than later in the movie. Yeah. 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 Uh, one more thing before we get to Martinez's note, which is I can't get enough of long-suffering Bruce Ng. Long-suffering <laughs> Bruce is like every scene in which they cut to Bruce and they're like, hey, we need you to do this in like three hours. And he's like, that normally takes 10 years. And they're like, yeah, but we need it in three hours. And he's like, ugh. And you just like, yeah, I, I, I picture my <laughs> mental image of Bruce just always has Pepto-Bismol in his hand. <laughs> like he's just, he's just all the time got an ulcer and he's just, I, I love him in the book and I love him even more in the movie. Uh, I love that actor too because yes. that actor is in um, Doctor Strange. Doctor Strange, yes. and he's such a delightful character. I mean, in Doctor Strange, he's also kind of long suffering. I think that might I be that actor's kind of shtick. Yeah, but uh, he's definitely just, <laughs> he's so good at just the oh, yes, I'll get it done, but I'm not happy about it. <laughs> <laughs> so Poor good. guy, like his family life is probably falling apart. Because I know. Of Mark Watney. But uh, he's but he saved Mark Watney. Yeah. So, so so Martinez. Well, yeah, we have that, and you know, it, we don't again we don't see it in the book them yeah. actually communicating, um, and this is they are getting to talk to each other. Yeah. Uh, and you know that it's exactly what Watney needed. Yeah. He's just being ribbed 
giving him a hard time. And it's, yeah. it's one of those things that you like love about your best friend because your best friend is always like really knows how to talk to you. <laughs> hey, ugly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. So I, I enjoy that. There's, there's always when you get that uh, character connection mm -hmm. is and like the full relationship in such a brief scene. It's always so lovely. And they did a great job here. Well, and in that same vein, again, this is just sort of the, the loving on the cast of The Martian Hour, but every one of these actors is so good, and the director is so good, that in that moment where Martinez is writing to Mark, and fundamentally what you are getting is revelations about Mar mostly Martinez's character and a little bit about Mark's because they're good friends, you also get a little bit of character from Lewis. Because as Martinez is writing and he says, I drew the short straw, so I have to write to you. There's a shot where it cuts to Lewis and she's like leaning over watching him type. And she gets this like semi scandalized look where she's just <laughs> yeah. like, I can't believe you just said that. Like, and, and it's just a great little extra bit of character. Yeah. You know, it's not just Martinez's scene. Lewis is there and she, She's played by an incredible actress, and we get a little bit of Lewis's personality. The basics, the basics of acting are, well, here's, here's the foundation. Acting is reacting. We yes. all learn it in college. Yep. And, but they're not wrong. Yeah. Like, it's that moment that you're like, oh, yeah, that's totally true. Yeah. Um, uh, of, it did, by the way, we have been doing The Martian starring Mark Watney, for like 95 years now, and I have a note here uh, that it took me this long to realize that there is only one letter difference between Mark and Mars. This is this is how long it took me to realize that Mark and what Mars are so similar. Okay, so, yeah. wow, mm -hmm. good note, Alex. Um, I know, right? Um, I have to say that at around this point, we get the the sound of the airlock fix because he duct tapes. Um, oh, the yeah. airlock closed. Listening to the storm. And listening, and that storm comes back. Yeah, this is this is another storm that is stronger than any storm on Mars could possibly be. And, you know, we just sort of look past that. This is a show yeah. about scientific accuracy, but there's also room for poetry. And yes, we need the moment of him not 100% sure that his fix is going to hold. Well, not only that, but you think of that sound of that thin thin plastic and that tape being the only thing that is keeping the outside outside mm -hmm. and the sound that that plastic makes in the wind mm -hmm. would have to, would be devastating for your mental health yeah and that's not something that you can keep in your head as you're reading a book right like you don't you're not going to go find that sound effect and just play it on loop but your brain's not going to do it either, mm -hmm. you know? And I, there's just and, something about it that's... And because of the format of the book, where everything we're reading, Mark is specifically choosing to tell us, it sort of filters out certain moments that he would have experienced that we get in the movie because we're just sort of the omnipotent audience watching him. And man, watching him ah, just sort of shouting in kind of primal, primate discomfort as that thing ripples is very powerful. Yeah. Um, he also, at this point, takes all the dead plants out, and there's a shot of piles and piles and piles of oh. dead potato plants, which is heartbreaking. But it also occurred to me, the terraforming of Mars has begun. Now there is officially biomass out on the surface of Mars, and I bet that at least one bacterium survived and is is able to live in those conditions. Well, this and is he even says in the book that some of the bacteria would have survived. Exactly. And so, you know, thinking back to the Mars trilogy, which I absolutely adore, there's a moment where uh, Anne, who is the 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 red, the Hephaestion, the one who who wants to keep Mars pure and and sterile, she gets so upset because they've released microbes onto the surface, and now there's no stopping them. There's no getting them back. Those are going to be on the surface and they're gonna spread and they're going to infect everything and we will never have a Martian surface without them anymore. And I have a feeling that happened. 
during the Martian. You know, yeah. people are going to look back hundreds of years, uh, hundreds of years later, and think, oh, at this layer in the soil samples on Mars, there's a row of bacteria that we dated back to the potato plants that Mark Watney grew. Oh, interesting. You know? I hadn't really considered that. So yeah. this is the beginning of the terraforming oh. of Mars. Yeah, this is the, there is life on Mars now because yeah. these tiny little bacteria that you just know that they're going to find a way. Right. Yeah. So Interesting. Funny little thing. Well, we head back to Earth for uh, Rich Purcell. P Rich Purnell. Oh, yes. excuse me. My autocorrect. What <laughs> a jerk. Uh, it's played by Donald Glover. Yes, this is this is Troy doing an Abed impersonation. Oh, yes, man, do I love Community or what? It's I know, so right? Good. Um, Donald Glover also can do no wrong. Yeah. So, yeah. I I think they did a great job of casting. I cannot get over the casting of this movie. Seriously, um, um, he is arguably the. I would argue that Rich Purnell might be the biggest change in how a character is depicted in the movie because I don't remember him having any of this kind of slightly Asperger's or some kind of like the the character in the movie clearly ha isn't 100% neurotypical he's he's got some kind of something right and I don't remember that in the book well except for you know we see him you know, interacting with his boss a little bit more. And he's his, a little gruff. And his and he asks for, well, can I have time off? And yeah. the boss is like, sure. And he's like, okay, I'm taking it now. And he goes like right back to what he was doing. Yeah. And so some of that would probably be indicative of and probably why Donald Glover chose yeah. to play it this way. I think it, it's close enough that you can sort of see the, the antecedents there. But I feel like the character from the book was being clever in how he used his vacation time. Oh, Whereas didn't. the character in the movie legitimately didn't realize that he was doing anything weird. Like there's a, there's a moment there where his boss sort of leaves and then leans back into the room and goes, you, you do get that I'm your boss, right? And the way Donald Glover plays it, he's just, he just looks up and he's sort of totally innocent, just sort of nods, yeah, I know you're my boss. And then he just turns back to what he's doing. And it's like he doesn't get that there's conflict in this scene. <laughs> You know? Right, right. I, I kind of see what you're saying, but I feel like I th my read of Rich and the book was a little bit um, atypical, I yeah. guess, of how. Okay. Oh, well, fair enough. Yeah. Uh, we do get a very charming uh, explanation of how, uh, oh, I guess this is, I think you're we're not there ahead. yet. You're yeah, not there never mind. yet. What I've, we I've actually got a note, get now. Teddy commands the room. So no. that's every We're, scene that Jeff Daniels I is mean, in. True. <laughs> but what we actually have is we jump back to Mars. Yeah. And Mark Watney is talking into his camera and he's telling us it's been seven days since he ran out of ketchup. Ugh. And I about lost my <laughs> damn mind. We were sitting on the couch together. He says that line. And from just to the left of me, I hear this voice go, oh, man. Just like deep heartfelt Listen, empathy. If it's all if it's all you have for seasoning, like you want it. Like I would I would take what is that weird Australian stuff that nobody else likes, just Australians? Vegemite. Vegemite. Like yes. if that's all that there was, if there was no salt, there's no pepper, but there was Vegemite, I would learn how to like that stuff because <laughs> anything yeah. is better than nothing, right? Yeah. And that's how I. And well, I, mean, I mean, that's I also how Mark feels. Remember, this is the guy who tried to make potato skin tea. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, exactly. So yeah. what I'm saying is like, and I get it. Ketchup, I feel, I'm pretty sure is like very American. Yeah. Um. So of course that's what Mark has been sent with and would want to eat. But yeah. I, I, f I felt for that man. Yeah. Because I'm certain he doesn't have salt and pepper either, and that's yeah. that's heartbreaking. It's all heartbreaking. Yeah. Uh, there is a moment here uh, when he's talking about his food in this in the same scene that kind of blew me away. I wasn't entirely sure how to take this because I feel like, I mean, I haven't actually run the calorie numbers myself, but I feel like maybe this is a a, a blooper. Like, I feel like maybe he misspoke the line or something. Uh, but what he says is, he's talking to the camera and he's talking about how much they are cutting back on his on his rations. Okay. Uh, and the line that he says, word for word, is, 
so instead of three of these every one day, it's one of these every three days. And now they're asking me to do this. And he cuts a third off of it. Which means that he went from having three every one day to one every three days. That's one ninth of what he should be eating. And now they're asking me to do this, and he removes a third of what's left. I did the math. That is 7% of what he should be eating. Yeah, that, that is a one-thirteenth right. ration. That can't possibly be right, right? I mean, okay. If you figure they say that you can last almost two weeks on water alone. Yeah. Then I suppose that this... But that's not, like, functioning. That's yeah, before that's you die in your bed. You can only right. last a couple no, of days before you start to, No, but what I'm saying is, like, if, you're, like if, you're still, if you're still getting... Because he's still taking his vitamins. Yeah. And... If you're getting a minimal amount yeah. of calories, yeah, it still yeah. Does, doesn't quite... The only thing that I thought may be what he means, that he doesn't say this, but this is... We established last week, Alexander's really good at filling in plot holes. Um, the only thing that I could think of is he's saying this as he's slicing up what is effectively like sort of meatloaf. Like it's a, it's a thing that was clearly sent for the astronauts. He's not eating potatoes. Yeah. So my thought is maybe what he's saying is he only gets this much of the food he's supposed to be eating, and then he's backfilling the rest with potatoes. Yeah, that's probably true. That, yeah, I have to assume that, because eating one-thirteenth of a standard ration is just because not Because we know that thing. the potatoes are just, like... Are just calories. He's not well, getting nutrition, like... But they're also, they're flash frozen, right? Yeah. So he can still eat them. Yeah, so if what he means is I'm getting this much protein per day and then I'm filling the rest with potatoes just for raw We're calories. We're going to go with that. Yeah. Just Seems to like make it right. Um, okay, so we have uh, another change, which is he gives Lewis the mission to yes. talk to his parents instead of Martinez. And I think that this change can easily be chalked up to putting Chastain on screen more. Yes, I think this is a Jessica Chastain thing. Yeah. This, and then later, at the end of the movie, there's a huge change yeah. in favor of her, which I would be interested to know. I don't know if we'll ever find out, but I would be interested to know if this was because of Jessica Chastain, the actress, like if she requested more screen time, or, or if the writers just felt like they needed to beef up Lewis's arc. Or, and, and it's not, it's highly unlikely that she requested more screen time. It's probably, she has a name. Yeah. And the guy who's playing Beck, nobody knows who that is. I mean, yes. So. I just mean, I wonder if it's based on the actress or if it's from a writing standpoint, if they felt that Lewis needed to be the one to sort of personally save right. Mark Watney for her own character arc. Which, um, we'll, yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll get there. It is interesting, though. And it's, I, I mean, I get it. Like, I totally understand it. I kind of like the Martinez version more. I like the fact that he's got a best oh, friend and I, he asks. I'm totally yeah. here for the way the book tells the story and not the way the movie yeah. tells the story. Um, I'm, I'm not wild about the idea of sending Lewis into the household where she's the one who chose to leave him behind. Well, like, oh, that's actually a good point. Like, sending Lewis is probably a terrible idea. Yeah, yeah exactly. No, you, like, you not, send Martinez because fair. he's the one who didn't make the call. Yeah, yeah that's so good. That's I, actually a really good point. I, I'm not in love with this change. Yeah. Uh, um, so then we get China. Yeah. So the rescue. Chinese, and yeah. they've changed the scientist to a woman. Oh, did they? Yeah. yeah. Because what we originally get is two gentlemen talking to each other. Yeah. And talking about how to handle the fact that they actually could help solve yes. America's problem. And in this, what we end up getting is a very old guy. Mm-hmm and a young woman yeah which is not how it was written in the book but that's fine yeah they basically changed it from venkat and tim to annie and and teddy i mean he's quite a bit older than that but what i, I just like, mean in terms of their roles like yeah. he is clearly the administrator of the chinese space agency and she is presumably like one of the one of the department heads or something Who knows? under him yeah but uh, well, she's a scientist. We do. Is she? I, yeah, I think oh, okay. we can. I mean, in the uh, what I'm going to say is in the book, it's a scientist, yes. and yeah. they don't tell us what her role is. So yeah. I'm going to say that it's a scientist. Fair enough. And I think 
I, I like that they did this because it, um, it's, you know, they went kind of out of their way to put a lot of diversity on screen yes. in the, uh, with the scientists. Mm -hmm. But we're also looking at it towards the future of science. Mm -hmm. and so you put out there what you want to see, right? Mm -hmm. And so I enjoyed this little change. It wasn't, a, yeah. it's not a huge deal, but yeah. I think it's important. Shout out, by the way, to Andy Weir, who wrote a very diverse cast. Yeah. Like they, they did not change the races of pretty much anybody except for Vincent. Uh, the, you know, Venkat Kapoor is clearly not a white guy, and Bruce Ng, and yeah. uh, I even, when I first read the book, I read Mindy Park as Asian. I don't know if that's ever actually hinted, just because I knew an Asian person whose last name was Park, but uh, yeah. It's, he, he did a really good job of portraying a, a very diverse group. Yeah. And then when Teddy gets the call from the Chinese, this is tying back to what we were saying earlier about subtle acting. I really appreciated the fact that, you know, he's, he's very professional, he's very uh, appreciative on the call, and then he hangs up, and there's this long beat of silence, and then he just goes, yes. And it's not what a lot of directors would have had him do, which is sort of pump his fist in the air and like really sort of, you know, be super excited and sort of race out the door to go tell his team. It's very understated. It's just, yes, in his chair, tightly contained sort of in yeah. his chest, and then he's back to Tiny stoic. like forearm pump. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like he's, he's <laughs> clearly, this is a guy who keeps it close to the vest, and this was something that is so powerful that he could not not express it so he just expressed it a little yep. bit and then he's back and i love that um so then we're we are in the room the elrond meeting yes project elrond and uh, annie has no idea what that is which is so awesome because sean bean is sitting in the room yes that's so it, great it was that was a lovely little crossover sort of thing that just that happened there a part of me wonders if that's how they thought of Sean Bean. <laughs> it's like they were working on this scene with Project <laughs> Elron, and they were like, I wonder if we can get, you know, like, they just started sort of going through the cast of Lord of the Rings. Could we get Ian McKellen for this role? Can we get Sean Bean for this? Can we get Viggo Mortensen? Like, yeah. who would be good here? Because uh, that's just a joke that is too good to pass up. Yeah. I, I will say that this is another place in which Annie isn't as profane and, yeah, and, and, and we miss hilarious. It. Um, as she was in the book. Yeah. She, you know, as, as profane as she gets is, I hate every one of you. Yeah. And that's it. Yeah. And I'm sitting here going, shame. no, 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 no. Annie swears there at least, she needed to at least drop an F line or yes. something. We need more really good foul mouthed women in science fiction. And I say that because Annie, they toned it down. Yeah. And they also toned it down with Avasarala on The Expanse. She's got some good lines on The Expanse, the TV show. If anybody out there is watching The Expanse, the TV show, she's, she's got some great lines. We love that show. Read the book. She is so much filthier <laughs> in the book. She is so foul-mouthed. It's hilarious. Like, in the, in the show, she's really just kind of brusque. Like, she, she just doesn't have time for this. In the, in the book, though, it is poetry. She yeah. just weaves these incredibly profane turns of phrase that are so hilarious. And we just, we need more of that. Like yes, that's, we do. And we need, to, we need to, to make it onto screen. Stop filtering it out. It's hilarious <laughs> and awesome. And it builds the character of these awesome women. Yeah. And yeah. And uh, at this point is when we finally learn what Rich Cornell is up to. Yeah, what his plan is. Yeah. And I love, so this is one of those things, you know, we were talking about whether he, sort of picked up on anything in the book that may have led him to this sort of uh, a little more um, atypical characterization. But one of the things that it really does nicely in the sort of mechanical sense is it allows him to be super expositional because the audience might not know about slingshot maneuvers, but everyone in this room does. This is not Except something that Rich Purnell needs to explain. I bet even Annie would know like, you know, she's, she's smart. She knows about a lot of this stuff. And <laughs> he just, he's walking them through step by step, walking around Teddy, literally, physically. 
and like pulling stuff out of his pocket. Pulling stuff oh out of his God. pockets. It's he's so sort of the the character that he has built. It is absolutely believable that he would be this expositional. Yes. Unnecessarily, and yet now the audience has got it. It's the yes. it's the perfect framing for a Teladonna moment. It was, and, and I, I love Teddy's reaction. Get out. Yeah. That's it. I also, just... I also love uh, Vincent popping the pen against Annie's forehead. Just Ow. again, more <laughs> more indication that these people have worked together for yeah. a really long time. That they. And he yeah. took the chance because he had like. If you're gonna, ha he has the opportunity. He's yeah. gonna do it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> he doesn't get the opportunity to do this yeah. too hard. Yeah, I enjoyed that. But I feel like the bigger, the the biggest sort of missing thing from Annie is not her profanity. It's that she leaves toward the end of this scene, and in the book we get an extra moment. So there's this scene between Teddy and Mitch, um, where he's talking about. You know, it's it, he says it's bigger than one person, and Mitch says no, it's not, which is sort of the central thesis of the whole story is that it is worth it to bring one person back. But in the book, we got an amazing scene where when Teddy decides to not do the Hermes return plan, the Rich Purnell maneuver, Annie rips him a new asshole. Do you remember that scene? No. Mitch makes a big deal about how they should leave it up to the crew, and Teddy decides I'm not risking the life of the rest of the Ares crew, and they all start to leave, and Annie stays behind, and he starts to say something about like the next press briefing, and she calls him a goddamn coward, and oh, she yeah. just rips him apart. We would be able to bring Mark home if you had a if you had the balls to let us, and she really sort of has the team's back. And that is one of the scenes to me that is important for Annie's character because the Annie of the movie is sort of just a PR person. Like you get the sense that she could work at a Hollywood studio. The fact that she works at NASA is kind of irrelevant. Um, she's just here to do a job. Whereas in the book, this scene really establishes the fact that she's one of the team. She is helping to bring Mark home. And he, Teddy's decision is hindering her efforts yep. to make this happen. And that is not only a great moment for her character, I feel like it really helps cement the team back on Earth and isolates Teddy from them a little bit. He's the leader. He's got that, you know, the, the loneliness of wearing the crown. And I miss that. I would have loved to have Kristen Wiig rip him a new oh, asshole. Oh, that would have been amazing. Second. In the movie, my favorite conflict is Teddy versus Mitch, yeah. which is saying something because I think the biggest conflict is Watney versus Mars, you know? Yeah. But in the book, that's my favorite conflict. Yeah. Um, but in the movie, I think it's Teddy versus Mitch just because they're such powerful actors. They're powerful, yeah. powerful characters. And seeing those two sit across from each other, sniping at each other, it's, and, yeah. and, you know, just the the way that Teddy can put down Mitch and yeah. just I'm boss sort of way yeah. is uh, it's fascinating to watch. I could watch a two hour movie of them debating what to do. Yeah. Like just those guys sitting in chairs just going at it. Uh huh. Um, so next up, we get this wonderful montage of the Hermes crew talking to their family because they they are doing you know the they're doing the rich Purnell maneuver um which by the way we do we do get the moment where mitch sends them the the rich Purnell maneuver and they uh -huh. they decide to do the mutiny yeah which and is a great scene the great this that scene i wrote down as it's either project king arthur's court <laughs> because they're all sitting around this table just trying to figure like yeah Lewis wants them to seriously think it through. Yeah. It feels like it's some sort of last supper or whatever. I don't <laughs> know, but I yeah. loved seeing them all sitting around the table, having this conversation. It needs to be taken seriously. I'm not going to just take your immediate yes as a yes until right. you hear me. Think about it. Yeah. yeah. Because Martinez is like, I'm in. And she's right. like, uh, yeah, except for we will be court-martialed. Right. So you need, and he's like, I'm in, mm -hmm. which you know he's going to say. But, you know, they... I also, I love Beck's response when she turns to the rest of them and she says, and for the rest of you, I guarantee they will never send you up here again. And Beck immediately goes, good. 
<laughs> he just leans, like he's here. You know, you really get the sense that not going back into space is the upside for him. You know, like he's, and, I'm here for it. Yep. And it's more, to me, it's more like, well, yeah, I've been up here longer than anybody else. Like, it's yeah. fine. Yeah. You know? And it's not good as in he would never have jumped at the chance again. Yeah, no, he would go he back, but yeah. Yeah, this is this was his goal, and he has met it, they, and yeah, let's do this thing and then be done. Yep. Um, yeah. Yeah. So next up, we get this montage of the crew talking to their families, and this is one of those things. So here on the synthesis, this whole show is talk, is about talking about scientific and historical accuracy in entertainment, and that is something that we care a lot about at Edgeworks. That's how we built Terra Genesis. That's how we do everything at Edgeworks is authenticity. And this scene I really love because it's authentic to the source material. If you go back and you look at the scene in the book, each of the crew members has a scene where they're talking to their families. And those are the scenes in this montage is you get Martinez getting kind of reamed out by his angry wife. You get Vogel talking to his kids. Each of these people are talking to their families and they didn't need to have them be exactly the same scenes from the book. You know, they could have had something where the, where the whole crew was talking to their families all together or whatever. Yeah. They didn't need to cast all these characters that we're only gonna get in for like one shot, you know, but they did. It's a little bit more accurate to the book and it's better that way. It's yeah. just unnecessarily accurate and good and I, I so love that. And then we have the montage of China and prepping yes. for the launch. Yes. And it's a stress relief. Um, it is the stress release of this movie. Because I think it's where we see uh, they are, is this, I think this is the moment where we see one of the scientists fall through the and mark. Uh, that is, uh, not, is that later? I think that's not quite now, yeah. but it's it's around here, yeah. So, but the the whole montage is fun, and that's what montages are generally made yeah. for. Yeah. Um, oh, and I guess it is. Maybe it is this montage. It's preparing the rover, and then also pre preparing the Tian Shen is the same. I think maybe it is. Yeah. Maybe, but in the book, Mark Watney is often the stress relief. Yeah. And so, because we're not getting that in the movie, we have to have it somewhere. And we're not getting it all the time and as, or rather, we're not getting it as frequently. Mm -hmm. And so this is a, a long set of yeah. here's the fun of what we're doing. And I do think that's where it is because it's when he's drilling into the rover so he yeah. can make space for the stuff that he needs to put into the trailer or whatever. I mean, they've changed this in the movie, but he jumping yeah. on the roof to get and it falls in and falls in and the sign and then we jump back to earth and we see it happen to the scientist there too yeah and it's or the engineer or whatever and it's pretty funny yeah uh this is also in the world of of relief this is where we get the first hint of beck and johansson yes uh and it's super adorable i love them in the book i love them in the movie i'm a big old softy and i love romance and Beck and Johansson, Beck and Johansson, I just love them to death. They're, yeah. they're both gorgeous. <laughs> they're going to make the gorgeousest babies ever. <laughs> and it's so sweet and so romantic and so awesome. Um, um, and so, unless you've got anything else before the time jump. Uh, let's see here. I have two things. Okay. Uh, the little robot moving around the hab. Yeah. What is that? That is the Sojourner rover. So the Pathfinder lander in 1997 landed, and the way it worked, unlike the, the you know, Spirit and Curiosity and Perseverance and all the rovers that have come after, those were just rovers. It was a rover that ran around. The Pathfinder landed, and there was a rover and then also a base station. So the thing that Mark Watney is using, the thing sort of looks like a pyramid, that is the base station for the Pathfinder rover. And then the Sojourner, which is like the size of a kid's remote controlled car, uh, was the thing that went out and sort of did the science and explored. Oh. And then it would transmit to the Pathfinder and then Pathfinder would transmit to space. Well, I totally and missed so, that, you guys. Yeah, so that little rover from the 90s 
is you, you actually see him find it and pick it, carry it with Pathfinder when he does that, but it's useless, and so he just apparently turned it into sort of a Roomba, and it's just driving around, because why not? <laughs> uh, he does mention at one point, when he's doing the hexadecimal sequence, uh, he does mention that for faster communication, the Sojourner has three pairs of wheels, and he could put hexadecimal codes on each of the wheels so that they could spin he the wheels, and, yeah. and he could get three bytes at a time. Um, but he doesn't. So, right, yeah. right. He just okay. turned it into a Roomba, which, by the way, if there are any, like, toy makers out there or anything, if somebody could make just, like, a, a Sojourner Rover that just wanders around your house, that would be hilarious. I mean, I'd rather it be, like, I'd rather buy one for, like, my nephew or something that's a... Yeah, a remote control A thing. remote control yeah. Sojourner. That yeah. would be awesome. Yeah. It's also funny, by the way, I don't know if everybody else feels this way, but when that Rover landed, I was, what, 11 something like that and that has just sort of been Nobody filed in the brain it's been filed in the brain of alexander as the size of mars rovers <laughs> and so now whenever i see a picture of perseverance or curiosity or spirit or any of them i'm always picturing something that's the size of a toy car and then every once in a while you'll see a picture of the rover like next to a guy and it's freaking huge <laughs> and it always surprises me every single time i see a picture of these <laughs> rovers to scale i'm always expecting them to be the size of the sojourner rover um i th my my last thing before the time we do jump. the time jump is the actual sound effect when you see soul whatever date oh that mm. sound effect Chirp is thing. yeah Ding. but it's like yeah. it's got such a it's so it's like it's like the sci-fi sound effect yeah and uh, there's something that I, it's it's the sci-fi or the deep sea yes. sound effect yeah and i like that it speaks to the yeah, the pirate kind of thing sonar vibe yeah yeah anyway i just i was i'm really taken with that effect but also you know, we just we have an idea of what sci-fi needs to look like for it to be sci-fi. Yeah. The the holograms and the colors, the, that that yeah. specific blue, or things like that. Or you know, if if you don't have the high tech ship, your stuff is going to be like the lower tech green. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, things like that. Where it's yeah. just we have we have this visual vocabulary or this auditory vocabulary that speaks to what we what we know of this genre and it's it's a pretty narrow yeah field yeah or space i guess i don't know um so i i i both like it and dislike it fair enough <laughs> uh well i think that's a good spot to end for tonight yes so we did not make it to the end of the movie as we expected as we planned totally, this all along totally this was our our plan holy buckets um yeah so we will pick up uh, next week with <laughs> the time jump. We do. And slow folks. Slow. S I cannot say your name. I don't know why. I always want to put the L in the wrong place. I am so, so sorry. Uh, so slow. Trash Panda says, so Mars is home to Roombas. And yes. you know what? I guess so. The only planet in the universe exclusively inhabited by robots. Weird. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Although anyway. not, you know because Mark's there, not in the story, but not in, in real story, life. But yeah. yeah. Um, so be sure to tune in next week yes. for the next episode of The Synthesis, where we will hopefully be finishing The Martian, oh, the Lord. film. I mean, Let's finish this. Yeah, that, that would be I cool. Think, I think we need to be done yeah. with The Martian. Yeah. So next week is the last week. If we don't get to the end of the movie, that's on us, and we'll figure it out then. Yeah. <laughs> but we're not doing another episode. I guess what Lacey's trying to say is that if we don't finish next week, that's on Jay Grape. And yeah. I I'm would never say that, as a matter of fact. No. Um, okay, so we will talk to you guys in a week. Yep. Um, in the meantime, subscribe. Yep. Be sure to subscribe and hit the bell so you're notified about yes. new episodes. Also, uh, check us out on Patreon. And you can check out some Edgeworks and Terragenesis merch some of which I am wearing right now, this Woo. Terra Genesis hoodie. Uh, check it out. Some of it is available on YouTube right below the video, and then you can also go to edgeworksentertainment.com and buy even more there. Uh, follow us if you feel like it. Yeah. Um, Alex actually tweets about science and space. I don't necessarily. You know, 
all opinions are my own and not my company's. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> yeah. uh, but, you know, join us, find, find us, uh, chat with us, and we're here to chat back. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, thanks for watching. Have a good night, guys.